this uh, third special session this afternoon is, is looking at uh, challenges for maritime intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, clearly uh, an absolutely central and crucial uh, topic uh, in the Asia-Pacific region at the moment. Uh, I'm, I'm Tim Huxley, the Executive Director of IISS Asia. I'd like to uh, introduce um, our panel in the order uh, that they'll be uh, speaking. Um, starting on my far right, uh, General Tansri Zulkifli Mohammed Zin, uh, Chief of Defense Forces, Malaysia. Um, second from the right, Admiral Harry Harris, Commander, United States Pacific Command. Uh, on my immediate right, uh, Vice Admiral Alexander Lopez, Commander, Western Command, Armed Forces of the Philippines. And on my immediate left, uh, Chris Chadwick, President and Chief Executive Officer of Boeing Defense. And uh, next down from him, Patrick Dewar, Executive Vice President, Lockheed Martin International. So we're very fortunate that on this panel uh, we have um, a combination of expertise uh, from the armed forces uh, of two regional countries and the United States and from two different uh, private sector companies in, involved in this field. And I, I hope that that will provide a basis for um, an extremely uh, stimulating and interesting discussion. Um, I, I, there's just one thing I should say before we start this session, uh, and, and that is uh, Admiral Harris uh, has to leave a little bit early. He has to leave at about um, 16.20, about 10 minutes before the formal end of the of the session, so... Uh, unless uh, you ask me a really difficult question, in which <laughs> case I'm going to leave early. <laughs> so, um, with, with that in mind, I'd like to, to, uh, to start this session just by making some brief introductory comments on the, on the topic, and then I'll hand, uh, hand straight over to our, our five panelists, uh, starting with General Zulkifli. Seems to me that the armed forces of uh, regional states um, and, uh, and coast guards in this region, by the way, face multiple challenges in relation to the maritime security domain. First of all, Asia-Pacific states confront an extraordinarily wide array of maritime capability requirements, ranging from the need to deter potential adversaries in territorial and other disputes at one end of the spectrum and then at the other end of the spectrum, requirements related to the protection of maritime resources, counter-piracy, counter-trafficking, and responding to natural disasters and accidents. And in each case, there's clearly a, a significant uh, requirement for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, ISR. And secondly, there's also the challenge of finding effective ways of collaborating with other agencies, and, partic and particularly with the navies and coast guards of neighboring countries, other regional states, and international partners. Most maritime threats can't be dealt with effectively on a purely national basis. To be effective against these maritime threats, armed forces and coast guards require at least some level of regional maritime domain awareness. The need for more regional maritime cooperation was an important theme to emerge from this morning's plenary sessions. But it's much easier to talk about cooperation than to do it. In this region, there are some important obstacles. Most importantly, quite a widespread lack of trust amongst regional countries. And secondly, of course, a lack of precise agreement on the nature of threats and where they emanate from. The third challenge is that of resources for capability development. Building effective maritime security capabilities is an expensive business. It may pose particular challenges for small and medium powers in this region. Indeed, it poses, it poses serious challenges even for some major developed countries. And this may strengthen the case for enhanced regional cooperation, whatever the obstacles. 
Well, time is limited, and I've, I've said enough by way of introductory comments. I'll hand over now to our, our five panelists, uh, each of whom has agreed to kindly make some introductory remarks uh, lasting uh, five minutes or so. So uh, first, I'd like to ask General Zulkifli to speak. Mr. Chair, panel members, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon. The conduct of intelligence, surveillance and reconnaissance or ISR activities is indeed a vital part of attaining situational awareness for the purpose of arriving to sound decisions. On that score, various sources, whether ranging from digital, electronics or human, are utilized to conduct ISR, which will be infused with other data to achieve a common operational picture where the decision-making process will rely heavily upon. The SIR activities would encompass areas of influence and areas of interest, whether at strategic, operational, or tactical levels. Malaysia, ladies and gentlemen, is a maritime nation where a significant volume of income is derived from its maritime waters. As such, the ISR conducted will entail activities within our littoral waters and exclusive economic zone stipulated in the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea or UNCLOSED. The conduct of maritime ISR has numerous challenges, which I would like to say as follows. Firstly is the geostrategic landscape. Malaysia is a maritime nation with a long coastline, sharing its maritime borders with six other countries. The two land masses of Malaysia are separated by the South China Sea with a distance of about 650 kilometers. The security of the line of communication between these two land masses is critical to Malaysia as it constitutes the economic lifeline between these two parts of Malaysia. It is therefore pertinent that Malaysia conduct continuous maritime surveillance to ensure the security of this vital line of communication. <clears throat> With long coastline, and given the complex nature of maritime security challenges today, the demand for continuous conduct of ISR on Malaysia is critical, especially for the various government agencies, especially for the Royal Malaysian Navy. As such, other government agencies, such as the Malaysian Maritime Enforcement Agency, the Royal Malaysian Police, the Royal Custom and Fisheries Department, would have to conduct maritime ISR within their own jurisdiction. For that, it would necessitate constant enhancement of shared awareness and infusion of data to formulate holistic responses. The Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea are partly within the Malaysian territory, have, of course, attracted the interests of many stakeholders. These stakeholders are either state or non-state actors with, in, with interest, including maritime security, sovereignty, commerce, nature or environmental preservation, transnational crimes, and others. The conduct of maritime ISR would be aimed towards defending sovereignty, enforcing laws, preserving, preserving freedom of passage, affording conducive environment for commercial activities, and deterring illegal activities. This wide spectrum of responsibilities to fulfill the requirements of the various stakeholders is, however, hindered by the lack of assets 
and advanced capacities, especially in conducting maritime ISR. Ladies and gentlemen, overlapping maritime claims has led to issues of sensitivity over sovereignty and sovereign rights among the claimant states, thus posing us a major challenge in the jurisdiction of conducting maritime ISR, especially in contested, in contested waters. It is therefore not unusual when COM military platforms conducting ISR operations are instructed to leave these areas by claimant states. These incidents create, may create provocation, which may lead to, a, to an accidental naval clashes. The Southeast Asia region is afflicted by non-traditional security challenges such as terrorism, piracy, human trafficking, and other transnational crimes. Granted that the maritime traffic in the waterways in both the Straits of Malacca and the South China Sea is dense, it would be a challenge to conduct maritime ISR to engage non-traditional security challenges. Hence, much time and asset will be required to weed out vessels that carry out these illegal criminal activities. Emerging challenges. Over and above the various challenges against security and stability faced by Malaysia, we take due cognizance of emerging challenges which would require more extensive conduct of maritime ISR. These challenges include terrorism and human-inflicted disasters such as pollution and mishaps at sea. Ladies and gentlemen, the way forward. Despite the numerous challenges faced in the conduct of maritime ISR, the way forward will be, firstly, acceptance of the ASEAN Code of Conduct. The ASEAN-sponsored Code of Conduct in the South China Sea was formulated as a conflict aversion instrument which would regulate measures taken by claimants in the contested areas in the South China Sea. Acceptance and adherence of the code of conduct by all parties would act to prevent conflict or provocative measures, especially in the conduct of maritime ISR. Secondly is the strategic partnership maritime ISR. As I mentioned earlier, the efficient and effectiveness conduct of maritime ISR to meet the daunting demands have been hindered by the lack of sophisticated assets and holistic synergistic measures between the various stakeholders. This is taking into cognizance about 70,000 ships ply the Straits of Malacca annually and about U.S. $7 trillion worth of commerce passes through the South China Sea. To mitigate these shortcomings, a strategic partnership will have be, would be able to help and must be forged as follows. Firstly, at national level is the interagency cooperation. The strategic collaboration between government agencies and government linked companies have been forged through many platforms such as the, through the National Blue Ocean Strategy and smart partnership between the Royal Malaysian Navy and the Malaysian the Shipping Company, IM, MISC, resulting in the sea basing program with Petronas, our uh, national oil company, and the conversion of MISC vessels for anti-piracy operations in the Gulf of Eden. Next one is the multilateral cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a known fact that security of the sea line of communications cannot be tackled by just a single country. For that purpose, bilateral and multilateral, multilateral cooperation have been established with littoral states, especially in the Straits of Malacca, 
to assist in securing their territories through the Melaka, through the, what we call the Melaka Straits Patrol. The Melaka Straits Patrols comprises of the Melaka Straits Sea Patrols and the Eyes in the Sky Air Patrols, both of which are coordinated surveillance activities within the participants' territories as well as the Intelligence Exchange Group. Countries involved in the Malacca Strait Patrol include Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand. Thirdly, gentlemen, is sharing of intelligence and network-centric data system. The necessity to exchange intelligence on maritime ISR between regional countries, especially on areas of common interest, cannot be understated. That said, this can only be done through the establishment of a transparent exchange system with continuous enhancement of trust and confidence building between regional uh, countries. Needless to mention that the efficient and effective application of intelligence would greatly enhance the conduct of surveillance and reconnaissance. This should be done through an extensive network-centric data system to afford real-time exchanges seamlessly. Technologies and exploring cost-effective ISR. The center of gravity for ISR is technologies, which will determine significantly the efficiency and effectiveness of these measures. Harnessing the latest technology would allow the user to see more, see wider, see further, see closer, and send faster, which will augur well with the formulation of holistic and timely responses. That notwithstanding, ladies and gentlemen, technologies do not come cheap to acquire, operate, or maintain. In this case, the application of new ways and approaches, like where Petronast has established and operates a network of radars on the oil rigs from which information is shared with enforcement agencies, including the Malaysian Armed Forces, to create a common operational picture, have managed to offset the high expenditure of acquiring such technologies by the government while creating a cost-effective ISR system. Not, last but not least, ladies and gentlemen, is military diplomacy. Challenges in the conduct of maritime ISR could be engaged through consultations and discourses driven by military diplomacy. It is imperative that goodwill should prevail in averting conflicts which may arise and creating collaborations to establish coordinated maritime ISR. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to say that the challenges faced in the conduct of maritime ISR are numerous, involving multiple stakeholders, whether from state or non-state actors. While ISR is important for a country to formulate sound decision, it is imperative that its conduct is in adherence to international-based standards or law, norms and conventions. The end state of maritime ISR would be to create a more stable, peaceful and prosperous region. With that, I thank you. Thank you very much, General. Um, you, you provided uh, uh, an extremely... Uh, succinct, but at the same time very wide-ranging uh, survey of the maritime ISR challenges from your national perspective, and I think that's a very useful start. Uh, I, I now like to call on Admiral Harris. Mr. Huxley, thank you for inviting me to speak on this panel and for the kind introduction. Maritime ISR, in my opinion, is a critically important topic as maritime domain awareness which ISR enables, supports effective maritime governance and security. I call the absence of maritime awareness sea blindness. Sea blindness, blindness results in uncertainty which impacts decision making and inhibits the ability to respond effectively to regional crises such as natural disasters uh, and search and rescue. Maritime domain awareness also helps countries counter illicit activities such as piracy, illegal fishing, and trafficking in all its bad forms. Effective maritime domain awareness is an essential enabler to keeping the sea lines of communications open. 
And while maritime domain awareness is important for any maritime nation, the level of maritime activity in the Indo-Asia Pacific makes it particularly critical. The Indo-Asia Pacific will drive the global economy for at least the rest of this century, and it has the busiest maritime crossroads of international trade in the world. The amount of economic activity in the region is simply astounding. The Indo-Asia Pacific has the busiest waterways in the world. You all know this better than me. For example, last year, over 78,000 vessels of over 300 gross tons each passed through the Strait of Malacca alone, which represents over 40 percent of global trade. <clears throat> and the United States has a significant vested interest in this region as over 1.2 trillion, and that's t trillion with a T, and two-way trade occurs between the U.S. and the region, and the majority of trade floats upon the ocean. So these waterways must be secure in order to protect and enable the economic growth in the region. This is why U.S. PACOM recently hosted a Maritime Domain Awareness Workshop for our ASEAN partners to identify opportunities to increase maritime domain awareness uh, in the region. From a strategic perspective, Maritime ISR also serves to bridge the gaps in trust. For example, U.S. maritime surveillance is focused on areas of uncertainty resulting from a lack of information or understanding or intent. People have noted that we have increased our ISR presence in the Western Pacific over the past few years. This growth is specifically tied to the increasing activity and increasing uncertainty in the region, such as the aggressive land reclamation in the South China Sea. As Secretary Carter indicated this morning, the U.S. is committed to rules-based principles and behaviors where dialogue and negotiation and mediation lead to dispute resolution. And as General, as General Zocchefli discussed, uh, I support the ASEAN Code of Conduct negotiations. So, as the purpose of this panel is about addressing the challenges of maritime ISR, I'd like to focus primarily on these strategic challenges. First, again, trust is key. Partners must be able to share information with the assurance of its security. Second, it requires a whole-of-government commitment, Cap capacity to sense activities on the sea, assess those activities, and coordinate maritime responses among partners takes a lot of work, and it requires a whole-of-government effort to build that capacity. And third, it takes practice. Proficiency in sharing information through routine exercises and personal connections is vital and requires sustained commitment from all of the parties. Tactical and, and technical challenges will always persist. We will always have challenges with capability shortfalls, prioritization of collection opportunities, and developing information sharing protocols. But I believe that we should focus on addressing the strategic challenges before worrying about the tactical ones. So in summary, Maritime ISR is a key enabler for maritime security uh, but the sheer size of the Indo-Asia Pacific region impacts what can be achieved by any single nation. Regional partners need to work together to maintain situational awareness and common understanding of events to alleviate the potential for misunderstanding or miscalculation. Each country in the region has cap capacity and capability to bring to the table. But equipment alone is simply not enough. It takes information sharing agreements, partner buy-in, and the processing, exploitation, and dissemination infrastructure in place to realize the full benefits of maritime domain awareness for the common good. If we work together to create a common operating picture, we can work to build trust between nations and avoid misunderstandings about the state of affairs in common areas. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral. Um, it was uh, great to hear the, uh, the U.S. perspective on this, this key issue. Um, I, I think there are, there are some important questions arising from, uh, from what you said about uh, the need for cooperation, I suppose, uh, questions relating to the practicalities of, of that in some, some cases, but maybe we can pursue that in the, the later discussion. Uh, I'd now like to ask uh, Admiral Lopez to speak. Thank you. Mr. Chair, fellow delegates, good afternoon. On behalf of the Philippine delegation, I value this opportunity to share with you the challenges for 
maritime security at the western front of our country. Up front, we all know that the term challenges is broad and, and, and all-encompassing. It means risks and threats on one hand. It also means great difficulties on the other. For the purpose of this talk, let me make this prepositional distinction. When we say challenges to maritime security, we refer to the threats or problems at sea, such as piracy, maritime terrorism, human trafficking, smuggling of goods, and other transnational crimes. But when we say challenges for maritime security, we mean ways and means or systems or the architecture to address those threats, such as coordinated trolls, etc., which are otherwise attached with issues to, the, to be hurdled and resolved. Hence, challenges for maritime intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance should be understood as those major difficulties that need to be addressed. Having said that, allow me to provide you with a broad canvas of the operational environment. The challenges to maritime security generally consist of human smuggling, illegal immigration, organized crime, drug trade, weapons proliferation, terrorism, piracy, trade disruption, and environmental attack. For the Asia-Pacific region, the stakes in the face of such challenges are considerably high. The region deemed an economic melting pot accounts for approximately a third of the world's population, close to 50% of globe trade, and 60% of the world GDP. It also hosts 21 of the world's top seaports, which handle more than one quarter of all the cargo container movements across the world. The region is likewise a security hotspot, where five of the world's eight nuclear powers, seven of the ten world's largest armies, and four of the world's eight largest missile arsenals are, are located. For Southeast Asia, the greatest threats happen in the Strait of Malacca, a strategic choke point where a great percentage of global commerce flows and where the majority of all the world's piracy incidents take place. The littoral areas connecting the Philippines, Malaysia, and Indonesia also hold the nautical highways of the Jemaya Islamiyah and our local terrorists called the Abu Sayyaf, who are known for their capabilities to wage maritime terrorism. In addition, two new areas have recently emerged to hold serious challenges to maritime stability, even as the same have stayed relatively dormant for a good number of years. These are the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea. For clarification purposes, the West Philippine Sea is the expanse of body of water that is part of the South China Sea, which is closest and of vital interest to the Philippines. The insecurities there are being driven by increasing territorial disputes, a sweeping claim over the entire sea and maritime area, and conspicuous reconfiguration of regional security arrangements. With these same areas, maritime degradation, poaching, and illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing continue unabated and have become pressing human security concerns. The New Zealand Contemporary China Research Center has noted that illegal and wanton destruction of marine life poses a great threat to fish stocks in the area. As they unfold today, the challenges are no doubt complex, unpredictable, and difficult to assess. As a matter of fact, they no longer fall strictly under either traditional or non-traditional challenges, but under the term, if I may put it, of hybrid challenges, the kind that blurs all distinction between the former categories and defies any easy evaluation as to whether they pose clear and present danger today or an overwhelming threat in the future, or the, diamet the diametric opposite of that, meaning a sea of opportunity now and a source of mutual benefits in the future. A group example of hybrid challenges, I would say, 
consists of the developments that we are seeing at the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea, particularly the transformation of the erstwhile submerged features into artificial islets or islands through massive reclamation and developmental activities with, the, with discernible major facilities which can serve two ways, as service stations for transiting ships and aircraft, as well as staging points for maritime, humanitarian, or as military bases for artificial island defense and force projection in the region. As we have seen them emerge last year, these hybrid challenges could stay dormant for the longest time without us noticing them right before our eyes, or they could quickly gather and enlarge themselves with corresponding complements of civilian and military ships and armed troops in response to any developing situation. The beneficial potential of these hybrids rests arguably in how the claimant states approach the issue of territorial claims and in the way they comport themselves in staking their claims. In this regard, during the last ASEAN Foreign Minister's Retreat in Kota Kinabalu, as well as during the 26th ASEAN Summit, 26-27 April in Malaysia, Malaysian Foreign Minister called on ASEAN to step up efforts to craft and implement a, bind, a binding code of conduct in order to prevent any misunderstanding or conflict. The danger of these hybrids, on the other hand, lies in their immediate challenge, or rather their immutable challenge, to boundaries established by international law and their disruptive impact on high-order interests like freedom of navigation and overflight, on the protected marine environment, on, sh on shared economic development, and ultimately on regional stability. Cognizant of this danger, the United States and Singapore released a joint statement during the third strategic partnership dialogue in February, calling on all countries in the region to resolve their disputes by peaceful means in, in accordance with international law. In a forum held in Jakarta last 21 April, a senior official of our Department of Foreign Affairs also stated that challenges to mar marine resources or marine resource management, such as the collateral destruction of coral reefs, should be addressed by all parties in order to realize the sustainable development goals of the UN Rio Plus 20 Declaration, covering oceans, seas, and marine resources. All those efforts at the diplomatic level notwithstanding, we have been seeing and hearing the challenges in two very precise words of warning, miscalculation and misjudgment, and misinterpretation, as Secretary Carter mentioned this morning. Our pilots and ship captains have heard it. Most recently, a CNN reporter on board a USP-8 aircraft heard it not only once, but a number of times. Remarkably, among the challenges identified, which include natural disasters, space and cybersecurity, weapons of mass destruction proliferation, and rogue actors, miscalculation potentials is included among the top of the list. If the issues in the South China Sea and West Philippine Sea generate the greatest common insecurities in the Asia-Pacific region, and if miscalculation and misjudgment are to be avoided to reduce tensions, then I would say that this must be the utmost priority in the relations of all claimant countries in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea. This is but confidence building at the tactical and operational levels, which can be done by military and civilian agencies on the ground. Unfortunately, the military and security services of contending states are not trained for that. So there is a need for them to be properly reoriented, educated, and trained. Stationed far out at sea, they must realize or be constantly alerted to the strategic consequences of their tactical actions. The management of encounters at sea or in the air, if handed well, 
will lead to mutual understanding between our countries. But if mishandled badly, could activate unnecessary and costly tripwires. This is where maritime intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance come in. Maritime domain awareness being the comprehensive monitoring of all pertinent areas for potential threats, as well as the continuously developing knowledge obtained from the integrated collection, analysis, and exchange of information related to the maritime environment. The supporting ISR systems must be employed 24 by 7. This is with the assumption, of course, that all concerned states must have the requisite ISR capabilities to begin with. The stark reality is that not all ASEAN countries have the ideal maritime ISR systems which can cover and track a comprehensive picture of maritime activities based on access information on everything that's happening from the, te from the territorial waters to the high seas, including littoral areas and port facilities. The first key challenge then is acquiring a common maritime situational awareness picture despite the differences in ISR capabilities. As propounded by Brian Finley, Johan Bergenas, and Asha Mufti in their study on dual benefit capacity, building to bridge the security or development divide, this, this could be done in a number of ways. First, by creating the appropriate environment to promote the civilian aspects of cooperation. Second, by information sharing and maritime surveillance. Third, by coordinating the participation and actions of all organizations and partners in a unified and integrated fashion. Fourth, by taking advantage of the opportunities given by information and communications technologies. And fifth, by orchestra orchestrating information exchanges between governments, business organizations, non-government organizations, the militaries, and private industries for common beneficial ends. Towards this end, the development of a regional hub that would enable the sharing of common data, common databases on Southeast Asia's maritime challenges at the least, or across the Asia-Pacific region at the most, could provide some transparency on developments and make a difference for peace. The next key, challenges, the next key challenge is maritime technical assistance and capacity building with a common focus on maintaining good governance at sea. That includes the freedom of the seas and facilitating and protecting trade and commerce. Several years back, in 2007, APEC quietly undertook a key project which cross-analyzed all the counter-terrorism action plans of all 21 member countries. At the end of the project, the counter-terrorism task force found out that the number one priority of the governments in our region was not actually protecting human lives, but protecting cargoes instead, which was consistent with the major efforts to fight piracy in the Malacca Strait. APIC then moved toward the direction of numerous initiatives designed to make the movements and footprints of millions of goods and people identifiable and tractable. These initiatives included the adoption of the RFIDs for cargoes, the IPSP code for ports, and the total supply and chain security initiative for goods, and the regional movement alert list for people. The development of needed human legal and technical capabilities in selected countries was supported by the technical assistance and capacity building support that came from G7 countries. Given the slew of maritime challenges in our area, this approach is most practical. The last challenge is finding a way to conduct joint maritime surveillance activities for shared interest without impinging on territorial sensitivities. You see, I have always been an, an advocate of jointness, of doing things together in order to develop unity, trust, and cooperation among all involved parties. But apparently, this is going to be a tough proposition. 
because maritime security cooperation is still only in its developmental stage in our region. And if history is a guide, previous efforts at countering threats and challenges from a joint and multinational level have not been very encouraging, particularly for Southeast Asia. Previous maritime security initiatives have been weighed down by sovereignty issues, cooperation rigidity, rigidity burden sharing issues, and capacity building issues. But then most of our countries enjoy bilateral and multilateral initiatives, such as the cooperation of flow intelligence training or CARAT, the Southeast Asia Cooperation Against Terrorism or SICAT, the Asian Coordinating Center for Humanitarian Assistance the Regional Hub for Information and Knowledge on Disaster Management, and the Regional Cooperation on Combating Piracy and Armed Robbery Against Ships in Asia, or the RICAAP, with the ISC established right here in Singapore. All this only means that we can and we must exert collective efforts to forge regional cooperation on maritime ISR, and this could be done through the development of a version of the Code for Unplanned Encounters at Sea for all Coast Guards in our region and as practicable with other government vessels being used for their respective purposes so that occurrences of events leading to miscalculations, misjudgment, or misinterpretation could be dramatically minimized. An architecture for a coordinated patrol among or between Southeast Asian nations in the South China Sea and West Philippine Sea may also be studied and undertaken, similar to how our border patrol exercises are being conducted with our neighbor in Malaysia and Indonesia. Given the ISR capabilities on, on board these involved vessels, maritime coverage could be significantly enhanced for mutual advantage, with the added value of providing deterrence in the immediate waters. Finally, in anticipation of any sea mishap, accident, or tragedy at sea, focused bilateral or joint exercises may be pursued in the South China Sea and the West Philippine Sea under certain agreed conditions. After all, fishermen now and then do get lost in the open seas, and the idea as well of vessels figuring in accidents or incidents or the prospects of uniformed personnel seeking emergency assistance while in the conduct of their while in the conduct of discharging their respective mandates are never far fetched. Let me conclude by underlining once more the maritime challenges we are confronted today. Today the lines are getting blurred and many challenges transform to hybrid ones, the kind which hold dual threat and benefit potential. In this rapidly changing security environment, the risks of miscalculation and misjudgment or even misinterpretation are well pronounced. It is only imperative and reasonable that we effectively develop a common maritime situation awareness picture for transparency and accountability, that we pursue technical assistance in capacity building in maritime ISR for common ends, and that we find a way to conduct joint maritime surveillance activities for our shared interest. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Admiral Lopez. Uh, you, you provided a very comprehensive survey of the, uh, the extremely wide range of uh, maritime challenges that your, your country faces and that, that no doubt you face um, operationally. And you've made a, a range of uh, practical proposals for, for cooperation in a, in a number of areas. And again, I think we'll, we'll need to come back to those later in, in the discussion because they warrant a very, very serious examination. Um, well, uh, we've heard from uh, three uh, military perspectives, and now we um, turn to our, our industry commentators for, for uh, two uh, industry perspectives. Uh, first of all, Chris Chadwick. Thank you, Tim, and good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure being here, and it's a pleasure to be on this panel with, with General Zukifli, Admiral Harris, Admiral Lopez, and Mr. Dwar. As we just heard from this side of the table, a sophisticated, real, under, 
real-time understanding of what's happening above, on, and under the water is essential to maintaining stability and prosperity for billions of people around the world. And as Admiral Lopez just noted, the highest priority here in the South China Sea. It has always been that way, and it will always be that way. What is different is the incredible transformation of maritime ISR capabilities, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance that are being driven by advances in information technology, which enables the transparency and sharing of information as highlighted by Admiral Harris. It wasn't so long ago that a military commander standing watch over an expanse of ocean could only dream of having a comprehensive and real-time situational analysis of the maritime environment. Today, it's real. With a few clicks of a mouse, that commander can pull together information from satellites, manned and unmanned aircraft, ships, and even underwater assets to form a picture of the situation at hand. A commander's ability to execute the mission has clearly improved and will continue to. However, in maritime ISR, as in most things in life, one can sometimes have too much of a good thing. While a commander has access to more data than ever before, that same data can easily become overwhelming. What is needed is actionable information. And the opportunity is upon us to focus more intently on how systems can correlate in ways that turn data into useful information within a common operating environment to provide a coherent picture of the situation at hand. A picture, I would add, that not only the commander, but all users should be able to see and update real time, whether it's strategic, operational, or tactical information. As General Sukifli noted, the picture will remain current. Here's a reality. The transformation in information tools, applications, and security requirements that is sweeping the post-PC and telecommunication world is global, and our customers want it. It enhances capability for their platforms, and it allows us to transcend the orthodoxy of how it used to be by providing our customers with solutions that they didn't even know were within their grasps. We've been working on this for some time now. Common information standards and protocols open software architectures, and common mission systems are important elements of delivering the actionable information our customers need. In the future, having predictive analytical tools that rapidly sort through gigabytes of data to generate a cohesive threat assessment that otherwise would have been lost amid a plethora of data is essential for optimal situational awareness and for a commander to make critical decisions. I think we can all say that we are making progress, yet there is still so much more to be done. Consider this. Right now in this room, everyone can access free live video feeds from thousands of locations worldwide. What was once available to only the most sophisticated military force is now available to anybody with a smartphone and the right app. That kind of access to information reflects our expectations in the 21st century. Building the capacity to acquire that level of information along with critically important correlated intelligence will help complete this picture. We in industry have to understand what commanders need and adapt our approaches to deliver it quickly and affordably. It's clear. Maritime ISR is being fundamentally changed by the information revolution. Our challenge is to simply make it real. Bringing insights to the national leadership and military commanders here in Southeast Asia so they can plan for what they will need. 
and we must continue to provide options that are affordable to acquire, operate, and maintain. Enduring peace and prosperity in the Asia-Pacific region is important to the world. Continuously improving the collective understanding of the maritime domain here is a mission we in industry share and feel especially proud to support. You have our commitment that we will do exactly that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. That was a, a, a very uh, compact uh, summary of your, your position on this, uh, this issue, and I, I think uh, very, very useful indeed. And uh, uh, finally, uh, our, our fifth panelist, uh, Pat Dewar. Thank you, Dr. Huxley. Again, before I begin, I'd like to express my thanks to IISS for the wonderful job that they've done here in making the 14th Shangri-La Dialogue a success, and especially for inviting myself and, and Chris as industry representatives to this panel. And I, I'd also like to thank the panel for setting me up here, um, uh, the, the three uh, force commanders, thank you, and Chris, indeed. Uh, for your insights. Uh, I will uh, go off the speech and say, as the fifth of five speakers, it is likely you will hear common themes, and I will repeat much of what you've already heard. But one of the things I'm going to end with, I think, is uh, Dr. Tux Huxley teed up in his introduction, which is resources and the critical uh, issue that surrounds after you uh, recognize the threat and you understand the systems that are required, how do you uh, bring the resources to bear? So the Asia-Pacific strategic environment is becoming increasingly complex, as we've talked about. Not only do forces in the region need to contend with traditional security challenges, but a host of non-traditional needs as well, from humanitarian assistance and disaster relief to search and rescue, and from counter-piracy to border patrol. Given these needs, it's not a surprise that ISR is among the most urgent needs communicated to us in our business engagements in the Asia-Pacific. Strong, well-integrated maritime ISR system is critical to allow countries to both detect and react to a variety of challenges and threats. We are the first to admit this is far easier said than done, as, as Chris indicated. A functional maritime ISR capability that provides effective remote sensing and situational awareness requires complex integration of sensors and systems, tools to interpret and disseminate the information that they collect, and the command and control capability to employ and direct them. This level of large system integration is challenging enough for one nation, but it becomes even more complex when you consider the growing need, especially here in the region, to communicate and integrate among multiple partner nations to create a seamless ISR architecture. And an example of this is the level of com complexity and coordination that was required during the aircraft search and recovery operations for Malaysian Air 370 and the Air Asia disasters. At the same time, as I mentioned, the tasks of armed forces across the region are growing as they are increasingly called upon as the providers of vital humanitarian assistance and disaster relief or to protect na uh, national fisheries. And so are we all, the United States as well, faced with rapidly growing demands on national capabilities and rapidly increasing mission complexity. And we've seen defense budgets being fortified to meet these needs. Of course, we all know that fiscal constraints and demands on budgets from all quarters mean that growing missions and even growing threats don't simply translate into double-digit increases in defense spending. So our customers in the region are naturally focused on greater value and affordability and determined to squeeze every, every capability that they can from the budget allocation. So one way to address these needs is a cost in a cost-efficient manner is to focus on bringing in assets that offer multi-mission capabilities. While it is true that budgets cannot simply expand indefinitely, the capabilities we're talking about are truly critical. So countries in the Asia-Pacific region must expand their maritime ISR capabilities, but at the same time, natural disasters are having more devastating impact, and border security has more grave implications than it seemed even 20 years ago. Platforms that enable the provision of a range of capabilities just make incredible sense. So, for example, we at Lockheed Martin have developed roll-on, roll-off capabilities for a C-130, as an example. It allows countries to use those planes as a maritime ISR asset one moment, then quickly reconfigure to supply disaster relief supplies the next, and then perhaps to provide command and control for the search and rescue operation, and then deliver equipment on a joint exercise. It's a, it's a sort of flexibility and scalability 
that is required, coupled with the ability to integrate, manage it, and sustain it. I, I could have used MH60 Romeo as an example, which is uh, utilized by some, uh, some nations as well as the United States, and quite frankly, every one of the industries that have platform capabilities have that ability as well. But the idea here is a value for money proposition as opposed to a single point of departure designed to do multiple, you know, to do a single mission, excuse me. So, and of course, so all around the region, we must find it, we find that it must be delivered in partnership with just, not just the nation's governments, but with their industries as well. So countries have seen that developing their industrial base within, will enable not just the maintenance and sustainment of current systems, but also grow, growth into the next generation of capabilities. And we see that as a good thing. We've watched local defense industries shift from co-development models that were more rigid and top-down to newer, more innovative and agile models that create capable and effective partners. And we're proud to be teaming with those partners on projects across the Asia Pacific. So that's a perspective from Lockheed Martin that we think is a win-win. And we're, we're certainly excited about uh, working with our customers and the industries here in the region on developing a, a security architecture, and particularly that one that is uh, integrated into the local localities of where they, they reside. So thank you very much. Then. Thank you very much. Uh, Pat, you, uh, you rounded off the, the, the comments from the panel uh, very very neatly uh, there with some, uh, with some quite specific uh, examples of, of, of capabilities. So uh, thank you very much for that. We, we have uh, just over 30 minutes for the discussion uh, session, but we also need to, to bear in mind that the, the whole panel, including Admiral Harris, will only be with us for, for 20 minutes. So if you, if you have uh, questions which are... Um, uh, which, which you'd like an answer um, from Admiral Harris to, um, maybe you could, uh, you could uh, ask those uh, at the earliest opportunity. Um, I'll, I'll take a range of about uh, maybe six questions to start with. If you'd like to ask a question or, or make, a, make a point briefly, could you please put your, um, your name board on, on end and... Uh, I'll make a list, and then uh, uh, once I recognize you to ask a question, if you could uh, just say who you are and what your background is, and then um, make your point as uh, succinctly as possible. Uh, Alex Nickel from the IISS, first of all. Thanks very much, Tim, and th thanks to all the, uh, the panelists. Um, my question is about um, the suggestion that we, we heard this morning from the the Japanese uh, defense minister, Mr. Nakatani, um, who uh, proposed what he called, a Shangri -La, what he called the Shangri-La Dialogue Initiative, um, which was quite wide-ranging, wide as you no doubt heard, but included um, proposals for improving maritime and aerial safety uh, in the region, in which he seemed to be suggesting uh, improved technologies uh, to share data, well, but first of all, to gather data, but then also to share data, um, to prevent incidents, uh, including private uh, uh, air incidents, such as we've seen recently. And I was wanting to ask the, the panel to comment on what they saw as being both the technological and uh, possibilities for this, but also any obstacles that they see. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex. Uh, so a question about the uh, Shangri-La Dialogue Initiative. Um, what the potential is and the, the obstacles. Um, Mr. Grandhagen. Thank you very much. Uh, Kjell Grandhagen from Norway, another maritime nation on the other side of the world, uh, also with some experience in, in uh, maritime uh, ISR. I, I am noted that Admiral Harris said in his uh, comments that uh, no nation alone can do the, the job. And you also underlined the need to share information and uh, the importance of trust here. At the same time, we heard uh, Dr. Huxley point out in his initial remarks that uh, maybe the lack of trust between nations in the region is one of the major challenges. So it would be interested to he interesting to hear um, Admiral Harris's assessment of this uh, what, what, what is the major challenge here? Is it the 
the uh, resources available for maritime ISR? Is it the mechanisms of sharing information, or is it the lack of trust that was pointed out? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hakstre. Uh, Yamagami from Japan. I have a question to ask uh, General Zarkifri. Uh, I listened to his presentation with uh, great interest, and uh, I, if I listen to him correctly, uh, General mentioned about the importance of uh, multilateral cooperation at the Strait of Malacca. So my question is related to anti-piracy operations since uh, uh, Admiral Lopez uh, touched upon the importance of recap in terms of uh, anti-piracy operation. Next year happens to mark the 10th anniversary of the creation of recap. And uh, how can we, as members of recap, it amounts to 20 by now, including the United States and Australia, so how can we help countries like Malaysia to become a member of the RICAP? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, uh, I think I saw you and Graham at the back there somewhere. Thank you. You and Graham, uh, Lowy Institute, Sydney, Australia. Um, my question is for all the panel, for anyone who would care to uh, respond from the panel. It's a general question on the theme of transparency, which some of the speakers have mentioned, some haven't. Uh, and it, it, it's, it comes down to this. I mean, if we're talking about non-state maritime security threats, piracy, illegal fishing, etc., I think that's a, a no-brainer. I think the more information that's out there and is shared, the better. But when you start go talking about state-led activities, it becomes more difficult. Mm where you um, potentially draw the line about what can be shared and what can't. Um, submarine operations were mentioned briefly. I think that's for obvious reasons. There are going to be limits about what governments are going to be willing to disclose and what can be shared freely, and what will be in the public domain and what won't. Um, it's really a general question about what are the limits of transparency, of the general principle that tra transparency can tend to, tend to uh, favour the the strong, if you like, uh, and disadvantage the weak. Uh, to what extent can that actually contribute to distrust uh, if followed through to its uh, logical uh, consequences? Or, or, or is transparency uh, an inherent good? I'd just be interested in the panel's thoughts on that. Thank you very much, uh, Ewan, for that uh, question, which I think goes right to the, the very uh, core of uh, the, the question of the obstacles facing uh, regional cooperation. Uh, Mr. Samadar. Uh, this is a suggestion that we have. You see, in the entire maritime domain, the key issue is that you cannot monitor the entire ocean all the time, every time. So uh, my suggestion is, and this is something that we spoke of about four years ago, of having a structured uh, organization uh, framework, a protocol, so to speak, which looks at you know an automated, uh, what I call as a maritime and air, automated routing and reporting system, which combines the ADB, the AIS, uh, satellite communications, and uh, land-based uh, LRIT systems, or even high-frequency radar systems to have very focused knowledge of the key areas of the ocean that, uh, that needs to be addressed. I think it is technologically feasible here. It would be nice to listen to uh, uh, some views on how we could just put together this whole picture together. In India, quite a bit of this has happened on the coastal uh, network. So it, it, it is possible to extend this picture on an oceanic uh, level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Yuiki. Thank you very much. Um, I have two questions. Uh, first one rather similar to the one that the gentleman uh, had asked. Um, one of the things that I would like to ask is, what, what do you think is the main objective of sharing uh, these uh, uh, information? Is, and uh, um, the reason why I say it, it, this is, if it is to enhance trust, 
and uh, avoid mis miscalculations and, and misunderstanding where uh, assumption being that the intentions are rather benign, so we want to avoid misperceptions. I think transparency is, is a good thing. Right? Um, if the other, on the other hand, if it is, the objective is to um, efficiency and uh, maybe reducing the cost of gathering uh, information, maybe there are limits to what we can share. So I'd like to hear your, uh, you know, thinking of what, what do you see as the main objective of sharing ISR. Um, the, the second question is uh, rather, it might sound rather basic, but uh, um, w would you think, and, and maybe for the, tech, the industry people as well, um, collecting information, it seems that if we do it collectively, uh, that would be more efficient and would reduce some of the cost of uh, personal and uh, otherwise resources-wise uh, in reducing this. But if we are to share this, it seems to me that uh, the, the cost may increase uh, if we especially want to do this uh, real-time and, and with the network. So what is the sense that you have in the sort of the cost-benefit <laughs> calculation of actually achieve, achieving this? Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Dufal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have uh, uh, two uh, brief questions for Admiral Harris. First one is I really like your presentation. I think the U.S. Uh, PECON really is security anchor in the Asian Pacific. So then uh, the significance, of course, is totally undeniable. So I really hope the POA's Navy could learn the way, not just to live in peace with PECON, but also could just have to feel comfortable under the leadership of PECON security anchor uh, based such a leadership in a region. But my question is this. Um, I really uh, like the, the, the another uh, concept you, you picked up, uh, describing the China's land reclamation as uh, building the Great Wall of Thumb. Um, it's a very interesting concept, but my view is that my, I, uh, my concern is using this concept is just a, some sort of overplaying some sort of uh, potential uh, risk arisen from the land reclamation, because it's still too early to say how such a land reclamation could function. And in what way, yeah, well, just uh, how they serve, uh, even the military purpose. So Chinese government also, it's, I'm not just trying to uh, defend the Chinese official position, but Chinese government also showed growing flexibility in the past two weeks. We would like to keep the, the, the land reclamation open. They also offer some sort of a regional common for a lot of scientific and humanitarian activities. Against this backdrop, so then it seemed to me that the military discussion from our American counterpart is very, very negative, very, very counterproductive. So concept of the Great Wall of Sun, it seemed to me, is some sort of a big push to get the Chinese land reclamation into the corner. So I don't think it's totally healthy to just create a proper climate to accommodate, as the John Kerry mentioned, smart diplomacy. So my question is, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to ask you in person. So what does the Great War of Sound mean in your vision of the China's future's maritime uh, posture? My second question, very brief, is um, I think U.S. and China consider the South China Sea now is uh, some sort of ways of stealing points. But actually, we have a lot of the things uh, more pressing, more significant uh, to cooperate. For example, the North Korea's nuclear issue. But if the, both Chinese and Americans just uh, endlessly tangled into the South China Sea issue, that will be a very deadly distraction for Beijing and Washington to work together over the denuclearization process. So my another concern is how both sides could properly just the competing on one way and the cooperating other way. Thanks. Jufang, thank you very much uh, for those very, uh, very Im 
important questions, especially the, the, the second one. Thanks for asking that. And uh, uh, finally, in this round of, of, of questions, uh, Mr. Cheng. Thank you very much. Um, this question is uh, two parts, I guess. The first part is to Admiral Harris, which is that um, there was no uh, specific mention here of the U.S. Coast Guard. And with all the discussion of the possibility of hybrid threats and whole of government, um, there seems to be missing from the American response the role of law enforcement agencies. And then uh, applying it more broadly to the entire panel is that what we are seeing in the context of hybridization of the threats is the blurring of the line between law enforcement and military between civilian agencies and uh, traditional military agencies. This would seem to have fairly negative consequences, whether it's for uh, crisis stability, whether it's for political signaling. And I was wondering if the panel could address some of that in the process of improving maritime ISR. To what extent are we seeing a blurring here between military and civilian authority assets? And therefore, what is at work here in the event of more crisis-type uh, activities. Thank you very much. Good question. Okay, we've, we've, we've got uh, questions from uh, eight delegates, and um, some of them ask more than one question. So I think that's a, that's a good range to, um, to start off with. And uh, bear, bearing in mind that Admiral Harris has to leave soon, I think I'd like to turn to him uh, for his responses to some of those questions first. Some, some of those questions, I must say, were, were very specific um, to you from people who are interested in your, your answers. So I'm going to put some pressure on the chair. So I've been asked uh, some pretty complex questions within questions within questions by Mr. Granhagen. Did I get that right? By Mr. Jafong. Did I, did I get that right? And Mr. Chang. So uh, I can take the, the rest of the day and try to answer all of the questions embedded within the questions, or I'll defer to Chair Huxley to tell me which question to ask first, because I don't want to monopolize the conversation. Okay, well, um, maybe you could start with uh, Professor Zhu Fang's uh, <coughs> question about the Great, the great Wall of, okay. of Sand and, and whether whether perhaps the U.S. is, uh, is uh, at least at the moment, perhaps overreacting to that, and it's a distraction from areas where, China and, uh, where the U.S. and China could, could very usefully and valuably cooperate. So uh, I'll, ta I'll take the question then about the Great Wall of Sand. Uh, I made that comment uh, a few weeks ago uh, in Australia uh, at a conference of the Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, I don't think that uh, I was overreacting, and I think the, the focus of many of the questions by many of the participants in this entire conference, not just in this particular panel, uh, focuses on uh, uh, Chinese land reclamation activities uh, in the South China Sea. Uh, I think that uh, it's important to consider the basis for the land reclamation activities, and that is that China claims the entire South China Sea, or at least 90 percent of it, as territorial waters. Uh, we take a different view of that in the United States. Uh, we view the South China Sea as international waters, as do, I might add, most of the countries, if not all of the other countries uh, represented uh, in this room. Um, I think that when you consider the magnitude uh, of the land reclamation activities, that is 2,000 acres, 2,000 acres larger than 1,500 football pitches, uh, then I think that you'll agree with me uh, that it, it is not insignificant. Uh, but I want to elevate the conversation up beyond uh, the level uh, of a dispute between the United States and, and the People's Republic of China. Uh, I believe, uh, as Secretary Carter uh, talked today, that we have that, that the uh, that the issues that all of us face uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific is bigger than just us and China. It's really about all of us, including the United States and China, and each of the countries represented here 
uh, in those countries uh, in the Indo-Asia Pacific that are not represented here today. So I want to elevate that conversation up uh, to that level. I think uh, the oceans, especially in this region, are big enough for all of us. And again, by us, I, I don't mean us, the United States and China. I mean all of us. So um, I ask that you uh, consider that, uh, if you will. I wonder if I could also ask you, while we're still able to benefit from your presence here, about the, 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 the group of questions that were relating to cooperation. Um, there was a question from uh, Alex Nichol about the Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, Shangri Dialogue initiative that's been proposed by Japan. Um, there was um, uh, Mr. Grandhagen's question about uh, lack of trust as, a, as an obstacle to cooperation. Um, there was Professor Uiki's question about uh, what is the objective of, of, uh, of cooperation? Um, is it about enhancing trust or is it about uh, efficiency and, and cost saving? Um, so there's a, there's a range of questions about the objectives and also the, ob yeah. the obstacles to cooperation. And, I, and I, I think Ewan Graham's question was, was, was particularly important when he, he, he underlined, uh, I suppose, the fact that, that cooperation on, on non-traditional non issues is, is going to be relatively easy, but once you, once you try to uh, share information that somehow impinges on the, the sensitivities of national armed forces, movements, and submarines, and so on, then it gets to be a, uh, a heck of a lot more difficult. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, let me let me see if I can process all of that in, in, in the in the in the head that I've got, which is small. Um, let, let's let me talk about the trust and the objectives of cooperation. I believe the objectives of cooperation is just that: we want to cooperate uh, in the maritime domain. There are a lot of competing interests and claims, uh, and and cooperation by definition, is going to keep us uh, from uh, resorting to other measures of conflict resolution. Uh, I think to, the, to Mr. Granhagen's question of what's more important, trust or resources or the modalities of modernization, uh, I think trust is the key. Trust is going to allow us to become better uh, partners and friends in the region to resolve these disputes, to eliminate the sea blindness that I talked about, so that uh, countries understand what's happening in, in your uh, areas uh, uh, and, and, and trust is critical. Lack of trust is going to add to suspicion uh, and the potential for miscalculation and misjudgment, which could give rise to conflicts, which could then give rise to uh, treaty obligations of various countries one with another. Um, but the key to, uh, once, once you get beyond the trust issue, and then the issue uh, becomes the modalities uh, and the how and the how we're going to do it. And I think that's where we must rely on our industry partners, uh, all of our industry partners, to come up with uh, different me uh, different ways and means, uh, technical ways and means uh, by which we can share information um, and um, um, uh, and uh, increase the transparency uh, of what's happening in our oceans. Um, uh, in, in, in my view of that. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral. Thanks for, for your presentation and, and, and for your, um, your, your very good answers to those questions. Thanks for your participation. Thanks. I'm getting the hook, and, and I'm going uh, to leave. But let me thank you all for your kind attention uh, and for your uh, challenging questions. So thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes or so uh, left, and uh, I, I think we'd all benefit from hearing the other panelists' uh, answers to as many as possible of those, uh, that good range of questions that we heard earlier. I'd like to give the remaining panelists uh, several minutes each to, to respond to the questions that stimulate or interest them the most, and I'd like to um, do that in the reverse order 
So um, we'd, we'd start with, with, uh, with Pat and then uh, Chris and then uh, Admiral Lopez and then uh, General Sukifli. So please um, choose any questions that were, were either directed towards you um, and you'd like to answer or, or any other ones that were generic to the panel. Thank you. Certainly. <clears throat> I will just answer the, I'll say the technology or the, the uh, can it be done question, both the SDI initiative which, as I made notes, was about uh, a common set of uh, operating norms that, that maybe have coalesced with the idea of a common op operating picture among multinational uh, forces. I think the answer is yes, it can be done. Uh, is there a mechanism to do it? Uh, that is actually probably more governmental than industry. Uh, I think, you know, it's probably fair to say that it can be done in degrees. Uh, I think some of the policy type questions and, and I, what I'm calling a policy question is, is there a blurring of the lines between military and, and civilian slash you know, criminal, criminal agency uh, needs? Uh, is there a, um, you know, what, what would be the utility and how would you use the data? Does it cross, if you, if you spotted a submarine versus are you just looking for surface threats or surface activity? I mean, all of these things I think go into the, uh, the, the national um, uh, discussion that was, that was alluded to to put together a framework about so what is uh, the common, what are the norms, and what sort of data would you share? I think that all has to come first. As a, as a, as a classic uh, industry uh, person, I'd say you need to give me the requirements first before I would answer it. But um, knowing what we know, and I think Chris probably has some of this uh, capability himself with the air defense uh, and some of the multinational air defense systems that provide common air operating pictures, uh, the answer is it, it can be done. Uh, and as I say, if you use that analogy, it can be done at various degrees. It can be done bilaterally that, and then shared with certain aspects, and it can be done in a, in a much more uh, sophisticated framework. I, I do believe that the answer back to my prepared remarks were this, uh, there is a resource rest constraint that I think the entire discussion has to have overlaid on it. That's, that, would be, that would be how I would answer some of those questions, and I, I know it might leave more questions, but that's the way this works. Thank you very much, uh, Chris. Sure, thank you. Uh, to give kind of an amalgamation of a number of the questions, I would, I would bound it uh, in two ways. One is the why is it's about data, changing, turning data into actionable information into smart decisions. That's pretty simple. On the philosophical side, understand that I'm not a politician, I'm not a member of government, I'm not a member of a security force. Uh, the shared and desired want of prosperity, security, and cooperation can be the catalyst. Open architecture that exists today with segmented data makes it doable. And the application of oftentimes commercial off-the-shelf technology that exists today makes it real. Uh, where we come in, it's applying it in an affordable way that that's an absolute necessity. And then to the question at the end, about the cost benefit. I think it's very simple. Without doing it, you do have C blindness. By doing it, you have C clarity. Uh, there's no stopping technology. It's here, it's doable. Um, and it's our challenge, I think, to turn digital into reality in a very affordable manner. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you very much for uh, the questions posed a while ago. I see that there's a, a, a uh, the focus of the question basically is uh, more or less the same in, all, in most of the questions. The thing is, uh, I've heard about transparency, about what's the, really the the purpose of the ISR and thing. In my presentation, we said that um, almost gone are the days that we see that it's a either. Uh, conventional or unconventional uh, uh, or non-traditional or traditional threats that we are being addressed, uh, we are trying, we are seeing in the region, and um, because of some some events that that that, 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 that have transpired very recently, we really don't know whether it's conventional or, or traditional or non-traditional. So that's where the sharing of uh, of uh, information with regard to addressing such uh, blurred. Uh, message or unclear message is very much important 
for a very small country such as the Philippines, even capability development is an issue. We have some norms, some policy, uh, uh, government policies that have to address. Couple that with other countries. So mean, uh, the, mean, the, mean, uh, uh, the way of communicating these capabilities will, really see, will be a very, very uh, big challenge for us. And um, whatever capabilities that one country has, in so far as maritime eyes are concerned, if it cannot be communicated, if it cannot be made to uh, network with other capabilities, it will be rendered useless. So in, in, the, in, the, uh, uh, in our region, um, info sharing, uh, protocols of making use of this uh, equipment, of these uh, capabilities is very much important for us to help to draw the real picture of what's really happening there at sea. And um, we, we, we hope that in this environment, in our region, let us see that the waters is not the thing that divides us, but rather the waters, once we dip our fingers in the waters, is something that connects us. So this is, uh, again, another way of saying that this ISR capability should work that way, should work that way. It's like in, in a, a uh, Ethiopian proverb, it says there, um, if the spiders would agree that their, unites, that, that their webs unite, they can tie a lion. So with that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your questions, and we hope to see a very uh, better, uh, uh, stable region in our midst. Thank you. Thank you very much, Admiral. And uh, finally, uh, General Zulkifle. Thank you very much, Dr. Huxley. I will have just about a minute or so. Uh, I would like to uh, expand a bit on the uh, getting uh, information, uh, conducting surveillance and the concerns uh, on a multilateral basis. Uh, if, there is good, if there is a common goal, uh, like what we have with our literal member states of the Straits of Malacca, Singapore, Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia, uh, we would be able to do it together. Uh, on a multilateral basis, using just one single platform from on a rotational basis, instead of having four platforms conducting uh, the same thing, uh, which does not make sense. But in order for you to do this, you must have some level of trust. And that level of trust, as long as the mutual benefit that you are going to get from what you're going to do together outweighs the level of trust, then you will do it and you will further build up trust on that. So that is the most important thing. Uh, we have experiences. Well, for the first uh, initial part of the conduct of the multilateral uh, coordinated uh, patrols or, uh, on the same platform, you will have some reservation, but as you go on, as long as you have got a common goal, then the trust will build automatically. And trust, ladies and gentlemen, can always be built as long as there's consultation, there's discussion, uh, I would say that. So you will be able to save a lot, you know, I mean, maintenance of the platforms will be lesser, the operating costs will be lesser, and you'll be able to share and uh, uh, the information and data together, and you will be able to analyze it together. Uh, so that is the most important thing I, 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 should, I should say. And this could be further expanded to other stakeholders, genuine and relevant, relevant stakeholders of the uh, line, sea line of communication, be it in the South China Sea or in the Straits of Malacca. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, General. And I think the, the point you made there about uh, a common goal being the basis for generating a, a, a level of trust over, over time uh, is an extremely, an extremely strong one that is uh, central to the, the, the questions that we've been discussing today about cooperation on maritime ISR. Uh, I'm afraid that we need to bring this panel to a close. Uh, I don't think that we've answered um, uh, all the questions. I think we've begun to answer 
answer some of them. Um, and I hope that in the, the work of the AAAS over the coming year, we can uh, look at some of these issues uh, in, in more detail and then maybe uh, pursue this discussion um, either through the Shangri-La Dialogue in the future or perhaps through the Fullerton Forum, the SLD Sherpa meeting at the beginning of, of next year. But uh, thank you very much to our, our, our panelists uh, from, from industry and from the armed forces for your uh, really excellent and concise presentations and for joining in the discussion and uh, to our, our delegates um, for your uh, excellent questions for those, to those who asked them um, and to the rest of you for your um, attention throughout. I think it's been a good session. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the dialogue.